Uh, Sonny's songwriting always mystified me. Uh, 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 it still mystifies me. I just found him then, and as I do now, an extremely engaging individual. It's just really musical and really thoughtful, and you know, you're never going to get shortchanged. He dressed in flowery shirts as well, and bounced around, and I think that's why people loved him. He reminded me of a cross between W.B. Yeats, with the, the mystical element of what he writes, and then Patrick Cavanagh, because Sonny's a farmer's son. He's totally himself, he's totally true to himself and to what he does. You, you would think that somebody with so much talent and so much ability would have some self of self-importance, but he, he has none. At the time I used to say that, that Sonny was a songwriter. I, I wrote songs, but I always regarded Sonny as a songwriter. I'm down in the city, you know where to find me. I'm down in the city, you know where to find me. I'm up on the top floor. I'm up on the top floor. Just under the moon. Just under the moon. Heaven is very blue the summer day. Sonny Condell was born in 1949 in Newtown Mount Kennedy, County Wicklow. My mother played the piano a bit and sang in the church choir and uh, my dad wasn't a musician but he uh, was passionately interested in music. Definitely really enjoyed my childhood and uh, teenage years. It was fantastic. Plowmen sweet in furrows, walking, walking. The um, first time I met Sonny was in Carpenter's Ballad Lounge in Carlo. That would have been 1968. We uh, got a gig uh, filling in for another duo, <coughs> which were called Homer's, Homer's Nods, Homer Nods. And uh, they couldn't do this gig in Carlo, and somebody asked us, would we replace them? So we did, and we went down. And this was a big expedition out of, <laughs> out of Wicklow and out of uh, our normal routine. And uh, it was only during the break that, you know, suddenly said, sorry Homer Nods couldn't appear tonight and I was thinking, oh very funny, and I think, they're not Homer Nods. Uh, and so, so I got chatting to Sonny during the break and, and borrowed his guitar, got up and sang a couple of songs. He started playing and he kind of knocked us a bit sideways because he was really, really good. <laughs> he could really play. As a kid, he actually played in a show band, which was based in, in Carlo, I think. Uh, the Tropical Show Band, and he would have toured all over the country doing show band gigs, um, which was a hectic life because uh, he was still at school, and so he'd arrive home at four in the morning and get up and go to school. <laughs> that kind of crack. Sonny's songs were fantastic. I was covering them before we even joined up. I was going around to his gigs and writing down the words of, of some of his songs. Watching and listening to Leo playing taught me an awful lot as well. Uh, he could play lead guitar and um, very rhythmic, a fantastic rhythm uh, style, which uh, I tried my best to, to copy and um, steal. Uh, so that's what you do, you watch people, I guess, and, and especially if they're right there playing in the same room or in the same venue or something. It's, uh, I think that's a, a big part of the learning process is to, to watch people and listen to people and see how they handle the instrument physically, you know. Sonny went to the folk clubs of Dublin in the late 60s, 
A lot of people would have been going to folk clubs. There were kind of folk clubs that you went to and you sat and you listened to traditional singers playing or guys with guitars playing, like Don Conroy, the, the artist, he used to sort of play down in a club in Mount Street and Luke Kelly and Barney McKenna would turn up down there. There was another one uh, that Donald Lunny used to go to in Molesworth Street. There was another one in Parnell Square. And um, you would drink tea or coffee, or I mean, I suppose some of the more hardened cynics would bring in bottles of Guinness or something like that. But it was a very innocent scene. In fact, the whole vibe at the time was amazingly innocent. There was soup in the folk clubs and coffee. And uh, in fact, alcohol was a, it was a bit of a no-no. If if one of, if one of the singers came in and he'd had a couple of pints across the road in Buswells, we'd we'd be, we'd be going tut tut. <laughs> Like, as I say, that's why these folk clubs were so important, really, because they were an, out, uh, an outlet for the sort of... It was original music rather than um, the, the ballads or, or whatever, or out-and-out -out pop music. You see, Sonny used to live on a farm before he came here. That's right. In Ireland. <laughs> where they've got lots of farms. And it's called Time is Like a Promise. If rain will fall high up here upon the mountain, grass will grow and shepherds will be thankful and our love will cover up. So I wanted to go to England. We both admired each other's music. So, uh, and so we said, for safety in numbers in a way, as much as anything, let's go together. And that was it. We just got the boat and landed in, in London on a sunny Saturday morning in May, I think, 1970. And we, we first went, not necessarily with the idea of forming a band, but we, we were two guys who played guitar. And sometimes we played together, sometimes we played um, solo. So we decided to set off on the boat and we had, I think it was 30, 30 or 40 quid each. And we just had the accommodation to figure out then. Sonny said, I've got some friends over in, in Ealing Broadway. So we took the central line right across London. It was, uh, I think it was evening at that time. Uh, and we arrived suitcases, really heavy suitcases at this point, because we had everything in them and guitars. And there was this woman sitting out in her nightdress on the step. This poor woman was mad, really you know, not to put too fine a point on it. I, I thought I noticed a little Irish twang in the, in the voice, and I said, we've come all the way from Ireland. <laughs> she said, Ireland, whereabouts? I said, Carlo. She said, oh, lovely Carlo, I worked in the sugar factory. Come in, come in. <laughs> anyway, we were in. Uh, about an hour later, we were off to a party with the girls across the road. Got chatting to this guy, said, what are you doing over here? We said, we, you know, we came over to seek our fortunes, basically, and we're looking to get a record contract. And he said, do you have uh, a demo or anything? I said, no. He said, I work in a recording studio. I'll bring you in after hours, a couple of days' time. So snuck us in, uh, and we made the demo with him, brought it to Chrysalis Records um, uh, a few days later. And a few days later, we had a record contract, so. But <laughs> it just goes to show if you throw yourself into a situation, things can happen, really. Leo's confidence was really, I think, what carried us an awful lot. So we marched into these record companies and um, sort of felt that we, we were as good as anybody, sort of thing. And sure enough, we got a, a recording deal, a three-year uh, recording deal, which was... We signed almost immediately without um, getting checked out or, you know, legal paraphernalia. We just said, oh no, it'd be great. They're a fantastic record label. They're great people on their books. Part the beats of day. I lift the cat from my knee and turn.
the first album first album was produced by a lovely man, Bill Leader, and he'd produced Pentangle and Bert Yansh and all our favourite people at the time. He was very m modest, uh, and and something that really worked, I think, on the on the first album. It's it's simple, it's direct. There's no no trickery involved. Like I remember at one stage, uh, living in a bedsit in in Baggett Street with my girlfriend and the only two albums were Paul McCartney's first solo album and Tiernan Oak uh, and it was just on all the time it was just part of everybody's life it was part of the fabric and friends grew small from me we worked with a string of different people but uh, I suppose the most notorious would be Jethro Tull and uh, Steel Eye Span and Progal Harem and Cat Stevens. The second album we wanted something a little bit more produced and t uh, Tony Cox who'd produced Caravan and people like that had, uh, he, he produced that but the third album was a lot more produced that was Matthew Fisher from Progal Harem the guy who played the organ on Progal Harem and he was a, a fabulous producer. And again, very, very sober days. People say, "Oh, you know, the '70s there must have been lots of drugs, drink, etc." Not at all. Not at all. Done, it was actually four years in, in London um, and towards the end we they had us working to a ridiculous degree and we sort of felt it would be nice to sort of lay off a little bit the gigs and, and we were like we're in that van up and down that motorway uh, in, in England. We must have played in every university, town hall, club that you could, at that time, you know, it was just an enormous amount of work. It was the incessant normal touring, you know, that our agency got us. I, th I think that was a bit of a killer in the end. You'd be in Glasgow one day, you'd be in Cornwall the next day, you'd be somewhere else, so a gig came in over there. So it was a bit, a, a little bit pointless. I mean, it was a lot of work for I won't say not a lot of result, but it could have been coordinated a little bit more easily. We approached Chrysalis about this because they were our agents, and so they were booking agents and publishing and recording and everything, management, and uh, they seemed to, uh, well, they sort of said nothing really. The first time we ever mentioned royalties, you know, we haven't had any royalties now for the last two years or ever. And the very next day, a bill arrived, you know, with all all sorts of different things. Taxi to Manchester, I remember, was one of the items. I think we've never got a taxi to Manchester. And it was kind of, this is, this is what happens. Sonny and Leo left Chrysalis Records and amicably split up. Sonny returned to Ireland in 1975. Um, I started thinking about playing solo, um, um, but there was, I suppose, um, a freedom to do something new.
remember the very first time I saw Sonny Condell playing. It was in the campus kitchen downstairs in the new science building in UCC. It was a tousled vagabond from Newtown on Kennedy. With a lovely full beard and wild pre raphaelite hair. I was in Goggins' pub in Monkstown. It was one day and met a gentleman who was working there in the bar who said, I know who you are, and uh, I remember seeing you in UCC. And he introduced himself, and that was Philip King. But he was very, very passionate about music, and we ended up playing together. And then we ended up living in a flat together. And part of the deal was, I was their driver, roadie, sound engineer, um, and we all lived in the same house in Marnick Lodge, just opposite the People's Park in Dunleary, which is a doctor's surgery now. And many people might have remarked at the time that it should have been a psychiatrist's surgery when we lived there, but uh, no, it was great. Great times. It was wild, and, and it was jamming day and night music. Um, um, and then rehearsals, a rehearsal place really, and, and living quarters, so it was kind of fried eggs and guitars and, and that sort of stuff. Um, madness. Everybody being in the same house, everybody was really committed to the band and you know we booked a lot of the shows ourselves so it was like a little cottage industry. We toured, I mean, it was quite adventurous at the time. We, we toured Ireland, we did stuff in the UK, and we worked a good bit in Holland, in Belgium. We had a good agent over there who had been, I think, possibly an agent for Tiernan Oog previously. So we did regular, we did a, certainly did a tour a year in, um, in Holland, in Belgium, with a, a Volkswagen van getting the ferry, Dunleary and I think there's actually a song written about it as well, one of those songs called Jump. Sonny continues to play with Scullion occasionally and they are currently recording new material. Since the 1990s, he's recorded several critically acclaimed solo albums which have not received much commercial success. Sonny and Leo also get together as Tiernan Oog occasionally and this year they celebrate their 40th anniversary as a group. I 
it's almost like the stories are, are, are stories like in the songs that Sonny might write or the, the, the artwork that he creates. You know, it's kind of spinning around in the atmosphere and like Sonny's the conduit for it and it finds him and he doesn't really have any choice. That kind of integrity is a bit of a rare jewel, you know, so you wouldn't want to kind of mess with it. Because he always looked light and um, about, not full of air, but just about two inches off the ground, and that's how I perceived him and his music. I would have seen him going from more profile to less profile to more profile to less profile, but not as far as I could see being hugely bothered by it, because what he was doing was writing his stuff and it didn't ever, as far as I was aware, make any huge difference to him, whether an awful lot more people um, kind of were aware of what he was at or weren't, do you know? I mean, the way I would have seen it would have been that he was just driven by what he was doing. If the country's any sense, they'll remember him as one of the, the great poets and artists and, 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 and songwriters of, of his or any other generation. He's a poet. I mean, he, he definitely is a poet. Uh, the, the way he, I mean, he used to be amazed when Sonny would play a new, a new song back in those days. I'd be going, fucking hell, how does he come up with this? You know, we're, and I mean, I see a boat, I see a boat, you know, that's it, end of story. I, I like being on the boat. But Sonny sees a boat, this, because I love stories, there could be anything else going on with it, there could be cows involved, you know. <laughs> I, th I would love the music to to reach more people and thereby have um, a little bit more money to to live on. I'm, I don't think I'm a greedy person or anything, but I would love it to to reach more people if people liked it. I would like to be able to produce the sort of music that gets played on the radio and allows us to... Um, to gig more and and perhaps to a few more people, but beyond that, I d I've no um, expansive dreams. Beyond that, uh, I mean, I the actual act of getting on stage, no matter whether there's four people in the audience or um, a thousand or whatever, it's still an amazing thing to be able to do and to to get lost in and. Um, to be able to express your feelings um, is is uh, is is um, payment enough to a large degree. <laughs> but beyond that, it'd be great to have a few more bob. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you.
blessed by good fortune Where do I send my thank you to Kind father Warm hearted mother No beating in the schoolroom A dry bed Milk and honey growing up on a wall Farmland That looks out over the sea this last day of heat wave in shade with the smokers out the silver tassel and the shiny poplar trees and here I sit and sit